Hello. That last stamp in our title sequence was a Tuppany Mint Post Office Mauritius of 1847, and it would be worth £150,000 of anybody's money. That is, if it was for sale, but it isn't. It's part of the British Library collection, and it's locked up safely in a vault. Not, of course, that stamp collectors would say that they're interested in the money, or at least that is what they'd have us believe. Well, this is the first in a series of ten programmes, which is all about stamps, envelopes, documents, anything that crops up in the post, things that might even come through your letterbox. And this first programme really hinges on the question, why collect stamps? And to help me find that out, I have my fellow reporter, Jill Cochran, and a small gathering of self-confessed collectors. Dr Douglas Latto combines professional obstetrics with, we understand, a rather nice line in elaborate practical jokes. Perhaps he might produce us a first-day cover of Edward, Edward the Confessor. I don't know. Dr Jean Alexander says she's a doctor of ice cream, but I know that that conceals high qualifications as a food scientist and actor extraordinary Mr Kenneth Griffith, who makes no claims at all, except, of course, when he's acting. So, why do people collect stamps? Jill. Well, of course, it's difficult to generalise. Every collector probably has his or her own reasons for collecting. But we took a camera team to the British Philatelic Ox exhibition in October and John Percival put the question to a number of passing philatelists. Well, I think everybody collects something in some way or another, whether it's bottle tops, um, picture postcards, old Christmas cards or anything. Stamps are, I think, are a quite a fascinating field. You've got plenty of scope. I don't think it's necessary. It is just fun. And it's, it's something, especially for a woman, I think it's very good because it gets one out of the house. You know, you join a couple of clubs and meet people, go to exhibitions. That's all. I don't think it's necessary. And it certainly shouldn't become a compulsion, I don't think. And you know, I've never let it. I find it very relaxing. Um, I find the um, seeking of information in official archives rather a, a form of excitement, really, and when I find the document uh, that ties up with some of the um, information that I've found in rubbish bins and things like this, it gives me a kick. I think that's all. I don't know, I just like sort of accumulating all kinds of odds and ends and sort of... I like sort of mementos of almost where one goes and stamps are a sort of memento really even though you haven't been to the various country concerned. So it's all rather fun. It's a, a certain amount of scholar in it I suppose, yes. If you do it seriously, of course there is. Uh, there's a certain amount of jigsaw puzzle in it too. There's a, lot, there's a heck of a lot of interest in those stupid little bits of paper. <laughs> I'm not speaking about the money that I invested into the stems and that have increased strongly in as long as the money itself devaluate. But I got much pleasure out of the stems and of my personal airmail collection whenever I looked into my album and whenever I have the opportunity of looking into my album, I do it because it does give me an enormous amount of pleasure. A random collection of collectors, at least those who agreed to talk to us. Perhaps philatelists are rather private people. I don't know, perhaps we'll find out. Jean, how did you begin collecting stamps? Well, I think I was really born into it because my father was a very, very keen collector and I was given my first stamp album when I was five years old and I was taken along to a lot of stamp meetings on Saturday afternoons and in among collectors I decided it was time I started collecting and when I was about 11 I wanted to collect either birds or flowers or something like that. Mm. Something and pretty? So, well, something like that, yes. And then it was suggested I heard of someone who collected waterfalls and that appealed to me so I started collecting waterfalls and stamps. And I'd like to see one of those. Ah, Your well, first one is... The first one is the Austrian Falls, the Krimmel Falls in Austria. Have you been there? No, I haven't been there. And the next one is the Bridal Veil vale Falls in New Zealand. And then we come to the Mauritius stamp showing the Grand River Southeast Cascade 
and the signature across this was the signature of the designer and the cancellation is that mm. of his um, cancellation from his post office where he's sub postmaster. And that of course is, is an added interest to a philatelist. Isn't oh it? Th this adds a lot to it and it's not the sort of thing you can mm. go out and buy. It, you need to know the right person in the right place to get this. So Philato, what kind of collecting is yours? I collect the uh, British stamps. And how did you start? I started with my brother Conrad. We collected as children. We enjoyed it and then we collected British Empire. We had a, quite a good collection. And then a friend of ours, Hector Munro, came down from Aberdeen. And he admired our collection so much that my brother took pity on him and gave him the whole lot. What? <laughs> what, without your permission? Without my permission. Oh dear. And since then that disheartened me a little bit until my children went to school and then my eldest daughter, Christina, I collected stamps for her. And one day I was going through Selfridges and I saw a penny black for three pounds for sale, which I bought. And I enjoyed it all the way home. I was looking at it on my hand all the way home and enjoying it. And I decided to keep it to myself. And from oh. then on, <laughs> I collected, uh, got really enthusiastic in British stamps. Now, what about you, Kenneth? You don't really collect stamps like Dr. Latto and uh, no. Jean Alexander, do you? I collect uh, British military postal history, that is the envelope sent by British soldiers in those many British wars. And uh, I, I started that when I visited South Africa in 52, and I visited Ladysmith in Natal, uh, which was the military centre uh, for Britain in 1899. And uh, while there, I saw the graves of British soldiers who died in that siege, and that stimulated me why they were dead, why they were mm. buried there. And uh, when I got back to Britain, I saw a Natal postcard, which was cancelled, Ladysmith Siege Post Office. And I knew that I was very close to the siege, and that has led me, that, the, the seeing of that postcard, has led me to make now, I think, six documentary films about the Anglo-Boer War. And of course, it's extended into uh, television and history much farther afield than that. But I wouldn't have made those films if it hadn't been for that Natal postcard posted in the Siege of Ladysmith. We can go back to this kind of thing later on in the programme. In the meantime, Jill. As you'll already have gathered from collectors who've talked to us, there are a number of different approaches to the hobby and a number of different forms a collection might take. Perhaps preeminent at the very top end of the stamp market are the classics, the stamps of the 19th century, like the Penny Black itself, or this Shalon head from New Zealand, Shalon because that was the name of the engraver, or this early pictorial, an 1892 American issue. But you need to be quite rich these days to collect the best classic stamps. Another way to do it is to collect first day covers, that stamp straight from the printers. And you can get those from the post office, like this Shakespearean issue of 1965, or from one of the many dealers who provide just this kind of service. Many collectors prefer the challenge of trying to assemble the stamps of one country, from its earliest classics, if it has any, to its latest issues. But again, to collect the stamps of one country is rather an expensive way of going about things. So another way to do it is to collect thematics at stamps on the same theme. They'll be from different countries, but they'll carry a similar motive, like birds, perhaps, or aeroplanes, or stamps which are associated with a particular event, the Greek Olympics there, or a particular person, the original Evita. A more specialist collector might become interested in collecting a particular printing technique, or stamps from a particular area of the world that might be remote, perhaps, or airmails are of interest to some, or Kenneth Griffiths's postal history stamps, they're of interest too. The list is endless. But what about the very new collector? He or she might do worse than to go along to his local stamp shop and ask them what they've got to offer, which is just what our camera crew did with their reporter, John Percival. This particular shop is on Pulteney Bridge, Bath, the stamp and coin shop run by Mr. and Mrs. Swindells. They cater for all kinds of collectors, from the experienced specialist to the raw beginner. So I asked Audrey Swindells what advice she would offer to a first-time customer. Now, if it's a child, I, we generally sort of think about these packets, because kids like, to begin with, they like uh, quantity rather than quality, and they want to fill an album, um, something of this sort, you see, and uh, just put loads of stuff in and they like these kind of things. Now that 
is rather nice. That's a thematic packet. And um, it's only in the last few years that this has been an, an acceptable form of collecting. And it's, it's great fun, and it's a lovely thing for some children to start with who don't want, perhaps they haven't got the same interest in geography and they don't want to find all the different countries, so they can just collect ships or dogs or anything like that. And in my opinion, you know, so what? As long as it starts them off, as long as it gets them interested. Now this is the stamp that I mentioned to you, and it's got pretty good per, uh, gum, and, uh, but as usual the perfs are rather rough. Crude, yes. And uh, you can see... Oh, it's got some OG on it. It's still got yeah. original gum, and it uh, will be quite a passable stamp. Brilliant colour, isn't it? Well, it's well centred for that issue too. It um, is. Normally the perfs are extremely crude. Yes. Um, as you can see, this paper is still in a lot of these. Yes, they've not been punched out, no, have they? No, they used not to clean the perf machine often enough and it would leave paper and you'd get blind perfs. You can see it better from the back, in fact. Yes, that's true. This particular stamp, a Western Australia Penny Red of 1864, is about to become the property of Mr. Peter Basterfield, who specialises in these issues. Yes, that's a nice clean cover. I can't see any plate varieties on it, Harold, unless possibly that R. There's a good stroke of colour been. through the R, but unfortunately no double tails for it. No. <laughs> <laughs> they don't grow on trees, unfortunately. Yeah. No, that's right. We'll, we'll have that one out, definitely. Jolly good. That was the almost scholarly concentration of the serious collector there. Now, Jean, when you're on the auction room floor buying stamps, do you find that there are many other women philatelists? Yes, there's quite a number of women philatelists, but uh, I think in a lot of cases more women be keener if their husbands could afford to let them collect. And, and do the great dignified philatelists, the, the men that you come up against, do they uh, treat you seriously? Oh, yes, very much so. As a I, collector? Yeah, I get looked after very, very well. Um, and mm, <laughs> the, the waterfalls, of course, we talked about before are, are really but quite frivolous. But not frivolous. nearly so many women collectors as men, not nearly so many. Mm. That's a pity, really, isn't it? Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> your, your waterfalls are, are obviously something that, that's pleasant, it's fun. Yes. But have you yes. a more serious side to your collecting? Yes. The main interest I have is in the 1929 Postal Union Congress issue. In 1929, the Postal Union Congress was held in London. And to commemorate this, the post office issued five stamps, a halfpenny, penny, three halfpence, twopence halfpenny, and a pound stamp. There we see the, the halfpenny block. Now, what's particularly interesting about those? Well, to me, I am very, very interested in the plates that were used to print the stamps and in the little markings in the jubilee line which bounds the actual block of stamps and under the third stamp you see a little white marking. It's just a, break, a breaking of the line really? Just a breaking of the line, that's of great interest to me, that proves it's plate three. <laughs> <laughs> well why, why is 1929 and that Postal Union Congress so interesting to you? Well when I started collecting this um, no one had really studied the issue and I had a clear field before me, no one really liked the issue. Part of the reason was that the um, issue included the pound value and when it came out in 1929 um, collectors were very much against a pound value in a commemorative set and they boycotted the issue and why did they boycott it well a pound was a lot of money in 1929 mm. and they just didn't buy the pound and some of the designs of the Tuppence Hapney they did thought were beer bottle labels and they just didn't like them. well that stamp is very beautiful isn't it it's, it's a very else. very nice stamp there were altogether 61,000 issued and they were in sale over the post office counter well into the 1930s. Now, the pound stamp was also an um, overprinted specimen in red, and this was given to delegates at the Congress. And unlike the other pound stamp, which hasn't the overprint, you couldn't go to the post office and buy one, and they're very much scarcer than the pound stamp. How much is that one worth, do you think? The pound stamp? Well, that, the pound that specimen? No, that's an awkward question, unless it's an auction. There's not that many come up, and they've been increasing in value quite a lot recently. Mm. Talking about money then, Dr. Latto, we, we said earlier that perhaps uh, true stamp collectors don't worry so much about the money, but you do, surely. Well, stamp collectors just can't help making money. Stamp collectors, they research into the stamps, they know a lot about them, and they can't help making money, whereas speculators may or may not make money. And a dealer will tell you that he often gets asked to, to, to make up a block of stamps for investment, purely for investment. 
Now, what is your opinion of the person who buys for investment only? I think he's, it's a bit chancy. And I no, think but he, do, you, do you think he's a true collector? No, he's not a collector at all. You wouldn't class him with no, you no, at no, all? No, 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 He's just a speculator. Well, what's, what's your collection worth? Well, my collection, it, it's very difficult to tell the, the value of a collection until it's sold over a post uh, an auction counter. There's no t way of telling. Mm. It's got to be sold first. But is this money that's coming into the you know, stamp market spoiling it for young boys who want to start collecting stamps? No, you can collect in all levels and you don't need to have a very valuable collection to have a very interesting collection. But I wonder how many small boys will ever achieve what, what you found. Uh, the first takeover, perhaps one of your most exciting moments? Well, after I've slipped away, they, they will be able to buy this when they've made a bit of money and then they'll enjoy the fun of having it. What's the story behind it? This stamp I found in Reading, and this is a penny black letter AA tied to the letter nicely with a red Maltese cross and cancelled in the Lombard Street Post Office on the 6th of May, 1840. So that's the first stamp of the sheet on the very first day of issue. That that's now is probably worth several thousand pounds. That's the first time that a, an adhesive stamp was stuck on, a, on an envelope and sent through the post. Yeah. The very first, first day cover. Yes. So what is your main interest then? Is, is, is it the the important bureaucratic involvement of the post office in bringing out its stamps and all, the, all that that goes into it. Proof sheets, for instance. Proof sheets. I'm very interested in proof sheets. And I wrote uh, five articles on proof sheets, and s since then they've increased in value some hundredfold, which wasn't a bad investment. And some of the later proof sheets, th there are very few stamps missing from them. The proof sheets were stamps were taken off after the Postal Union Congress and sent to the colonies about 22 off each sheet but later on they stopped uh, cutting them off but here is a sheet of 1900 stamps of which there are only two missing and I have them both the first one cost me 36 pound 10 and the second one 85 pounds and uh, Tony Rigi said the second one I told him I'd bought one he said the second one must be in the raw collection and I said no Doug who has got that one as well what are they worth now difficult to see I, I would, I wouldn't, uh, mm. I don't want to sell them at all. Since it's, uh, since it's very popular to knock the royal family on television at the moment, I think it might be worth mentioning that there's a very strong rumour that His Majesty George V, with a royal pair of scissors, nicked most of those missing stamps. Uh, would you care to join me in that? No, uh, that's mm. quite right. He and Lord Crawford went together and, yes. and helped themselves, yes. but uh, they didn't get that one. No, they no. didn't. Um, where, where does the practical joker in your nature come out that we mentioned before? Well, I, I make various investigations into post office. For instance, the smallest letter allowed in that, in that time was four inches by two and three quarters. And so I put a smaller letter to, through the post and then a smaller and a smaller and a smaller. <laughs> and eventually they were not acceptable. And so I said, in that case, it's a parcel. There's no minimum <laughs> size for parcels. <laughs> was, it, was it delivered? And the two uh, parcels that I... Put, they were cancelled with a parcel, but next morning they didn't arrive. And I was a little upset about it, but of course, naturally, at 11 o'clock, a four-ton lorry trundles up to the door, and when they find my parcels, they were duly delivered. <laughs> and also, haven't you, you yourself appeared on the, on the face well, of the stamp? How did when, that happen? When uh, Winston Churchill was, uh, had his picture on stamps, designed by David Gentleman, of which I've got these designs, I decided to put a picture of myself on a stamp, which I did, and the picture came through in quite large numbers, one in perforated and the rest perforated with a leather puncher. It actually came through? Came through the post. Couldn't well, you have done you time for that? Yes, I'd like good. to know. Quiet, you yes. know if my... Weren't you breaking the law? I was breaking the law, probably, and they asked me to come on television then, but I thought there's no, no uh, excuse for breaking the law, and so I... I lied lo lay low, <laughs> but I got 180 letters from all over the world wanting mint blocks of four, used blocks of four, and things like that. <laughs> Are they valuable? Well, you, none have ever been sold, and so the, the, I would have spoiled the joke if I'd sold any of them. I'd like to, uh, uh, I'd like to return to this Ladysmith siege and be very serious about it, but I am preserving my sense of humor, I promise. Um, I'd like to return to this because I don't think you really got the serious message when I start. You see, that cover, that envelope, says, I mean, the postmark reads in two straight lines, Ladysmith Siege Post Office, 17th of February, 1900. 
the uh, pen inscription says no stamps and it's to Major Donegan, Royal Army Medical Corps, Cavalry Brigade, Judge Reformed Church, Ladysmith. That was posted. That was posted to the senior medical officer of the Cavalry Brigade in Ladysmith during the siege. And I think it was sent from a doctor also, unless he sent it to himself, which he might have done. But the Boers who were besieging Ladysmith, they also had their postal service. And they carried with them into Natal, the British colony of Natal, they carried their own stamps, their Republican stamps. And that is a Transvaal penny Republican stamp. And this is cancelled Hooflager. Hooflager means headquarters, Ladysmith, 23rd of December 1899. So this cover is besieging that one. Well, they're obviously all very enthusiastic about their collections, and enthusiasm is a vital part of collecting stamps. But, of course, so is equipment, and that's what I'm going to show you now. Probably children will start with an album like this, which is a pictorial album with um, the stamps of different countries in there. But they'll soon gradate to something a bit more specialised than that, a loose-leaf album like this with... Um, this one here, with uh, graph paper inside, so that when they actually put the stamp onto the page, they can line them up quite simply, like that. When they're putting the stamps into the book, they'll be using hinges, and it's wise to get quite good quality hinges, otherwise you'll damage the glue on the back of the stamp. Sometimes the glue on the back of the stamp is as important as the, the picture on the front, and in fact, if you're very careful, if you're very worried indeed about the glue on the back of the stamp, there's this rather specialised album here, which has got a vinyl strip in it, for, and this is particularly for mint stamps. Here we have got the mint stamps in this vinyl strip here, so that they never actually have to have glue on the back of them. That's a very specialised album, and there are other albums, of course, for things like first day covers here, and something that's akin to the ordinary photograph album where you can put postcards. You see I'm actually touching stamps and hinges with tweezers. I'm getting quite used to doing this now so that the oil from your hands doesn't actually get onto the stamp and damage it. And if you want to look at the finer points of a stamp, you'll need a magnifying glass. But of course, the true collector will need the collector's Bible a Stanley Gibbons World Catalogue, and that tells you just about everything you ever need to know about what stamps are worth what. Although, of course, as they said, that unless you're actually auctioning stamps, you don't really know the true value of them. You don't have to have something quite as expensive as that. You can have this little book here, which tells you all about British stamps, and that's only 95p. I think that's jolly good value. So stamp collecting can be as expensive or as cheap as you like it to be. You can get the stamps off friends, off envelopes that actually come through the letterbox, or you can invest thousands on a philatelic rarity. And that's it for this week. Our thanks to Dr. Jean Alexander, Dr. Douglas Latto, and Mr. Kenneth Griffith for allowing us to peep into their very fine collections. Next week, we shall be going back to where it all started, at postal history from the ancient Egyptians to the invention of the first postage stamp in 1840. Until then, can I leave you with this little thought? Postage stamps were once defined by somebody as dirty bits of paper that someone else has spat on. Makes you think, doesn't it? Goodbye.